And now we welcome to the podcast, Neil Ferguson, fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Neil Ferguson has taught at Oxford, Cambridge, the Stern School of Business, the London School of Economics, of course, the famous graduate Mick Jagger, as we never cease to be told, and Harvard as well. The author of more than a dozen major works on economics, military history, and diplomacy, Professor Ferguson has just published Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. Welcome to the podcast, sir. It's great to be here. Mick Jagger was not one of my students. I'm yeah, I hope much not. too young. <laughs> All right. So you, your book inspired, of course, by the West reaction to COVID uh, or the Wuhan flu, as we're not supposed to say, lest we be accused of all sorts of unfortunate xenophobia. But before we get to that, tell us a bit about the politics of catastrophe and our fascination with doom. And when I say that, all cultures at some point have their period where they're they're obsessed with decline. I mean, you go to the museum, you see these great pictures of the four stages of empire ending in catastrophe and, and decline and the rest of it. So it's always there. But there seems something unique in the West and in America in particular, in the post 70s fascination with dystopia and collapse. And you have an entire generation of children brought up on Hunger Games novels who have incorporated the sort of inevitability of dystopia into their worldview. How, tell us, you know, how doom plays a role in society and whether or not there's something unique about this moment that made the last year's doom what it was. Well, it's a great question. I was in fact thinking about this before the pandemic struck. I wanted to write a book that was focused on the history of the future. That is to say, I wanted to read my way through as much dystopian literature as I could and offer some thoughts as to why we are so fascinated with the end of our species, the end of the planet, because it is unquestionably there in abundance in science fiction and uh, not only in, in novels, but on the movie screen. So that was my pitch to my publisher. And they kind of were giving me funny looks like, why does the historian want to write a history of, of science fiction dystopias? And then uh, to my relief, some real dystopian events happened. We, we had the pandemic, which so many different novels had imagined. And, uh, and, and that gave me an opportunity to, to get this book written. It became more than just a history of future disaster. It became a history of all disaster. And I, I noticed two things as I was writing it. First, we as a species are fascinated by the end of our species. It is a preoccupation of all the great religions uh, that there is going to be, or at least uh, most of the great religions, better watch it here because it's not such a big story uh, in Judaism. It's a big story in Christianity and Islam, indeed even in Buddhism, that there are uh, there is some great reckoning, the end end time is is coming and this this clearly is something deeply embedded in our in our psyche uh, but it leads us to uh, overestimate the probability of the end of the world and and constantly predict it um, to the extent that we then become slightly paralyzed when uh, a medium-sized disaster happens uh, for me it was so somewhat symbolic that so many people during the lockdowns were sat watching that movie Contagion as if the real thing wasn't really quite entertaining enough. They needed the, the much more disastrous pandemic to get the rocks off. I think that what's very interesting about American dystopia, especially as it's been articulated in, in American science fiction over the last half century or so, is that there are, there are the political dystopias Gilead uh, in Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tales, just one of, of many, in which usually the wicked American right produces some kind of totalitarian nightmare. Um, and then there are the sort of natural disaster dystopias, uh, uh, like The Road, uh, in which we sort of laid waste to the planet and all that's really left to do is trudge through apocalyptic wasteland waiting for the zombies to strike. And, and I think that kind of gets to where the, 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 the imagination of, of much of America is today, certainly of liberal America, because we're either in Gilead or we're in, in another Atwood uh, dystopia in which the species has largely been wiped out 
by a combination of climate change and, and genetic engineering. This isn't a particularly plausible future to my mind, uh, to put it mildly, but it's clearly the, the sort of default setting when you ask people what the future's going to be like. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is interesting how every time we come up with a new technological innovation or an advancement in technology, there's always a coterie of people who will extrapolate that to something that ends civilization. Uh, you know, H.G. Wells was a great one for finding the horrors to come in technology. E.M. Forster, of all people, wrote an incredible novel called The Machine Stops, which essentially predicts the internet world, connected connected world that we have today, and the decline of it ends to the end of civilization. So we keep, I mean, in one sense, you could say it's, it's, it's just typical human ingenuity. We see these things, and some people take them to bright utopian views, and other people take them in darker places for, for, you know, for, for entertainment purposes. But the question is... Yeah, happy clappy utopias just aren't very interesting, and and therefore mm. don't sell. And that that that's clearly why the the overwhelming majority of forays in this direction uh, imagine dystopia. I mean, I think Mary Shelley deserves some credit for really originating this mm-hmm. style with the Last Man, in which a disastrous plague wipes out everybody except one dude who's kind of left. Uh, to wander around Europe uh, in in a somewhat desolate state of mind. But Wells was the guy who made it popular because actually Shelley didn't have great success with The Last Man. And the genre kind of owes a lot to Wells for, for certain tropes. The alien invasion, uh, which we are very preoccupied with, but which, so far as I can see, hasn't yet happened, is a is a good example of 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 Wells's uh, contribution, and then the, the time machine is is great because in, in the the time machine it leads you to dystopia, however far you travel, until finally gets the very very end of <laughs> of everything, and it's like oh god, well this is this is how it ends with a sort of uh, totally uh, blasted and and devastated lifeless planet. I have ninety more questions, which inevitably end up in Star Trek, and I know that will make Peter very unhappy. So I'm going to give it right <laughs> now to Peter before, to Star be, Trek, before that happens. Before that happens, one of the more utopian. It uh, is one of the more happy, clappy ones, world. indeed. Neil, we, you and I spent an hour chatting the other day, and that interview has gone up on the web, and I have been reprimanded in the comments for f- failing to ask one or two follow-up questions. So I'll get to those, but at the moment, you're on a topic that is so fast. I want to ask a question of my own in that regard. Who did a better, while we're on the history of the future, who did a better job? Who got it? Who, who, who was more accurate? Orwell or Huxley? Huxley is the answer. Orwell's been by far the most influential author of, of a dystopian novel. 1984 outsells all comers. And, uh, and with good reason, because it's obviously a brilliant work and I'm a massive Orwell fan, but the central thesis of 1984 was wrong. The central thesis, which Orwell actually outlined in an article in 1945 for the Tribune, was that all nuclear superpowers would be slave states. That, it, And this is a, an extraordinary piece of journalism. It's the first time the phrase Cold War is used. Orwell oh, says the, that the new. He, all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's okay. where it comes from. It's often misattributed. It was, it was actually Orwell. We should have known. But Orwell says that the Cold War is coming. And in this Cold War, there will be three nuclear superpowers the United States, Russia, and China. And they will all be slave states. And that's really what 1984 envisions. Uh, he took the idea, runs with it. And Oceania, which the UK is part of, is, is the American is the American totalitarian state. Mm. Now, we all read this book, uh, and I think it's good that we read it, but we ought to remember that it was wrong, that the United States did not become a slave state. And all theories of convergence, and there were many into the 1960s, think of Galbraith, who thought that ultimately a kind of managerial capitalism would start to look a lot like communism. All of that was wrong. The US actually did not converge with the uh, with the Soviet Union, it diverged most clearly in the 1980s. And that was, of course, the decade that decided the Cold War. So I think all got it very wrong. Who got it right? Well, not necessarily the, the really best selling novels. Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which was written in the 
mid 1990s has stood up very well to the test of time. He, for example, thought that we would all end up spending half our lives on on what is the internet now, and our avatars would be having a better time than we would in the real world. And and his depiction of of California as a sort of grimy wasteland that people are happy to escape from into cyberspace really works well. He also envisions mass migration towards the United States as a feature of of this future order. So I I recommend Stevenson's Snow Crash to anybody who wants to sort of see how it's done, because he he quite shrewdly anticipates a lot of of what we see today. One more question on on this. I want to get back to the current book, but you're but you just don't slow down enough, you know, to, to let people catch up. You have a book out, which is about the pandemic, but now you have a new article in the Spectator, which is on Cold War Two. I mean, you just it's it's very difficult to keep up with you, even in talking with you, Neil, let alone reading your work. Okay, but one more follow-on question to this notion of the history of the future. Nineteen eighties. To any alert observer. We're not losing the Cold War. By the mid 80s, it may be unclear. It's still unclear that it's going to end as suddenly and quickly as it does at the end of the decade, but we're no longer losing. Things have changed. The dynamic has changed. And yet people were still quoting Whitaker Chambers, who said that when he broke with the Communist Party, he did so in the consciousness that he was leaving the winning side to join the losing side. And I can't, you may remember the the year of the book, Jean Francois Ravel in 84. 485 publishes How Democracies Perish. And this French intellectual slim volume is taken up and read across the United States as a, as a, a, a we're, we're this close to. And uh, so how is it that there seems to be in democracies, or maybe it's unique to this country, there seems to be a turn of mind that expects the worst of course, you could say during what Paul Johnson called the 70s America's suicide attempt that believes the worst of the country, that also expects the worst. Why does that turn of mind seem so, seem almost the modal in a country which is prosperous and at peace and which did win the Cold War? This may be a, a healthy thing, paradoxically. In other words, it may be good to be a republic haunted by the prospect of, of Weimar uh, or Rome, in the sense that it, if we keep worrying about those things, we might actually do the things necessary to, to avert them. On the other hand, the expectation of the dissolution of the Republic can become an obstacle to clear thinking. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, I write about a bit in, in Doom and also wrote about in The Square in the Tower is the the almost hyperventilating response of a great many people on the left and many conservatives to Donald Trump's election. And we were told consistently, really from the moment he became a candidate, that the Republic was in danger, that we were Weimar America. You know, think of Timothy Snyder's book, which was sort of 10 tips for surviving a totalitarian regime. And I felt all along that this was overdone and that the whole point of the American system had been to design a Republican order that would be demagogue proof because the founding fathers knew that somebody like Trump would get to be president. And they they had that in mind when they de- devised the separation of powers and made sure that this was a federal system. And, and, and it worked. I mean, the system basically worked far, far better than you would have been led to expect if all you'd done was, you know, read people like Snyder or, or my good friend Andrew Sullivan, who was always... Uh, predicting the end of the Republic. Now, the end of the Republic clearly sells. It's it's a great story, and it's been a great story decade after decade. Um, and it, it, it's, I think, one of those things that's never going to go out of style. And as I've said, it may not be a bad thing to, to worry about these scenarios, but I think if it leads you to inflate every challenge to your most cherished liberal beliefs into the end of the republic, uh, you, you're going to you're going to start miscalibrating your your view of the world. The key thing in the the U.S. China race, 
is not to become China in the process of competing with China. And, and this, this notion which prompted that Spectator article is really the kind of punchline of doom. The punchline of doom is you all want to talk about climate change. Yes, I get that that is a serious problem. But if one looks back over the last hundred years, the thing that kills people prematurely in very large numbers is totalitarianism. Right. And we should be a lot more worried about totalitarianism uh, in the 21st century than we are, because we now are up against a very successful totalitarian regime, which is clearly much better at a lot of things than the Soviet Union was. And even worse than that, we're sort of importing totalitarian modes of behavior into our own society. Uh, and that's that's the kind of doom that I worry about the most, especially especially when you use one form of disaster, whether it's a pandemic or climate change, to justify erosions of civil civil liberties that actually might pave the way to totalitarianism. Give a give an example or two, if you would. I've got the Spectator article open here on my screen, and I'm tempted to read it, but reading an article to the man who wrote it is a stupid waste of time. So could you just give us one or two examples of what you well, see in the United friend, States imitating China? It was Fraser Nelson, the editor of The Spectator, who drew my attention to the fact that Joe Biden had suggested to Boris Johnson on a phone call that there should be a Western version of One Belt, One Road. And I'd missed that. Um, and, and I thought, well, hang on, that, that sort of fits into a pattern, doesn't it? Because another debate of the moment is, why doesn't the United States have a central bank digital currency like the clever right. People's Bank of, of China? Well, come on, Federal Reserve, where's your central bank digital currency? And then remember what happened last year when uh, the, it, the, the scale of the challenge posed by COVID-19 finally became clear to policymakers in about mid-March, the response was, oh, we'd better copy the Chinese and do lockdowns. Uh, interestingly, the guy whose name I nearly share, Neil Ferguson, ah, the, yes. IL, the guy who was the, the Imperial College epidemiologist. I felt who, quite cross with you two or three times before it twigged that, it, that he was not you and you were not he. Sorry about that. Seen my hate I, I from, wronged you in my own mind once or twice. From there, people yeah. who can't spell. Um, thank you, Mum, by the way, for spelling my name the funny way. I know it often gets mispronounced as Niall, but I was really glad of it last year when the other Neil Ferguson, N-E-I-L Ferguson, was saying that we had to lock down. Now, he gave an interview just the other day to the Times, the London Times, saying, well, of course, we got the idea from the Chinese and, and we weren't sure that we could do it because we're not a communist society, but it turned out we could. That that really was a uh, moment that. of truth. I missed that. That <laughs> yeah. is astounding. Uh, it is kind of amazing. So we have been copying the Chinese in, in, in a lot of ways, some conscious and some unconscious. Uh, a good example of, of what's going on, which is semi-conscious at the moment, is I think we've got up to three different plans that the Biden administration is, is putting through Congress. And uh, all of these different plans, the infrastructure plan, the COVID relief plan and the family plan, whatever that is, um, these all, in addition to costing a cool $6 trillion, are plans. And if there's one thing that we uh, constantly fall into the trap of admiring, it's the way that communist regimes plan. Right. And I wish I had a Bitcoin for everybody I've heard say, oh, if only we could take a long view like the Chinese yes, yes, um, yes. and have you know high-speed rail links, dot, dot, dot. So this is a very familiar pattern that goes back a long way. The, the osmosis of, of war, the osmosis of competition, where you're competing with a totalitarian regime and unwittingly or consciously, you start becoming like it. The, man, the managerial technocratic cl class loves China because they can make trains happen very quickly and they adore the trains. But they also like the idea, as Paul Krugman once said, if we could just wave a wand and be like China for a day, think what we could get done. Really? All those wonderful plans. And the plans, is it's not necessarily emulating the Chinese now. If you look back at the 50s in American urban design, they wanted to level all the cities. They had plans for everybody. It was the same sort of top-down, we know best instinct. We'll remake the society for you and you'll all be better, happier for it. But when you talked about importing, one of the things that we haven't imported for China is the fact that we've developed a surveillance society all on our own by volunteer effort. I mean, in 1984, it was imposed on people. We have brought into our houses the cameras and the listening devices that, that, that we want to snoop on us to make our lives better, to, to listen to us, to hear our... I mean, we can argue about whether or not that's a threat soon enough, but you mentioned contagion, and it goes back to doom. 
the movie Contagion shows a pandemic that was that was uh, by, uh, worse than what we had by a factor of 100. Bodies stacked like cordwood, to use the cliche, everyone dying, dropping in the streets. So people began the pipe pandemic by seeing the, the classic example of what happens when a disease ravages a country. And that did not happen. By every measure, we did not have the contagion situation. Yet, the mindset was that we had. And what was it in the, in, in the Western psyche that seemed to take this and never, ever be able to understand that it wasn't as bad as we feared at the beginning and that we might be overreacting? We've, you know, we've developed a mindset now that seems to keep people institutionalized in the prison of their own fears. That's self-imposed. That's something that our culture permitted these people to do to themselves. It was right to worry that it was as bad as contagion or as bad as 1918-19, the, the Spanish influenza, right at the beginning, when you didn't know anything. So January, when I first heard about the strange new virus in, in Wuhan, my first reaction was, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of, of my friends, including Nassim Taleb, published a paper in January saying, we should act like this is as bad as possible. And that means acting very quickly to shut down travel from China and to limit spread. And that was the right thing to do before you knew anything. And that's what the Taiwanese did. So the Taiwanese who have every reason to be paranoid about China and not to believe what Beijing says, acted in the assumption that this was going to be very bad and rolled out something that they, uh, they had been thinking about for a while, mass testing, because you could test very early on once the thing had been sequenced, contact tracing using uh, phones, and then isolating anybody who was infected. And they did this so successfully that the grand total of deaths from COVID in Taiwan is 12. 12. I'll say that one more time, as opposed to 550,000, which is the running total in the US. So... There was a moment to panic, and it was right at the beginning. Larry Brilliant, an epidemiologist I got to know writing this book, had a great TED talk back in, I think, 2005, where he said the key to pandemics, and he's one of the guys who eradicated smallpox, the key to pandemics is early detection and early action. And we wholly failed to do those things. And in, in the process of failing, and it was a protracted failure, we failed in January, February, and, and to, into March, we left ourselves with a very, very limited number of options to prevent a really significant number of deaths, more potentially than half a million. And without much deep reflection, we jumped uh, to the conclusion that the Chinese lockdown was the way to go. Now, I think by mid-March, we knew a lot more about the virus. We knew that it killed the elderly disproportionately and hardly killed any young people at all. We knew that from the Chinese data. We knew that the infection fatality rate varied so much between age groups uh, that it was almost meaningless to say what the average infection fatality rate was. We knew that it was a super spread of virus, i.e. about 20% of the people infected were doing 80% of the spreading. We knew all that by mid-March. I know that because I was reading uh, the, the research coming out of uh, the affected places, China and Italy, like I was drinking from a fire hose and I was gaining enough knowledge to see that this was not 1918, 19, and it definitely wasn't the movie Contagion. So I felt even at the time that the, the lockdown strategy was a very blunt instrument for contending with the, the spread of the virus and likely to have significant costs, including costs in terms of mortality, but also other costs that might be in excess of the benefits of containing the spread. Now, this is an argument that some people really don't want to hear because they really want the other Neil Ferguson to be right, but they want to believe that a very large number of lives have been saved by lockdowns. And I'm not sure they'll ever really be able to prove that. A, there's lots of mortality that we've seen in the last year and a few months that came as a result of the lockdowns. Remember, not all the deaths in the last uh, year or so were caused by COVID. It's actually 13% of total deaths in the US. And quite a lot of the other deaths, quite a lot of the excess mortality that occurred came because people didn't go and get the checkups that they should have got, uh, or the overdose numbers went up. I mean, there are a bunch of unintended consequences of 
the lockdowns that we haven't really properly measured. There's a big toll in terms of mental health uh, that we are still going to uh, take some time to calculate. And I think when we finally can do a full cost benefit analysis, we'll see that the benefits of lockdowns weren't really that much greater than the costs. And, and this is a really important point that our colleague at Hoover, John Cochran, has made, the public was adapting anyway. It's not like we were just going to carry on completely as normal without shelter-in-place orders. Cochrane predicted correctly that people's behaviour would adapt once they heard that there was a dangerous virus in town, and it did. And Austin Goolsbee, who was in the Obama administration, did a paper showing that most of the changes in mobility predated the government lockdown orders. So there's not a, con I don't think there's a counterfactual in which people just carry on completely blithely and we have like a million deaths. I think people would have changed their behavior in the absence of, of, of regulations. And it doesn't seem like there's enormous variance between states that locked down tightly like California and states that did not like Florida. Actually, the outcomes look pretty similar in those two states. So long-winded answer. But I, I mean, I think one can see that the right thing to do was the early detection, early action option, the Taiwanese option. Uh, copying China in mid-March was definitely a suboptimal response. And I am pretty sure that even then we could have done better. We could have been smarter in mid-March than we were. Neil, the, the, really quickly, the follow-up question that is being demanded in the comment sections of our interview, I didn't ask, and apparently I should have asked, Taiwan, the death rate in Taiwan is low, the death rate in South Korea is low, but might not at least part of the reason be that those countries are located geographically in such a place that they have wave after wave of SARS sweeping over them. And the population already has in one way or another, some immunity, certainly a much greater immunity than we did. Well, that's a difficult one to be sure of, but it's certainly not the case that they can... All I had to do was ask it. Right. So it's <laughs> not the case that people in, in Taiwan, South Korea, or Japan, for that matter, had been exposed to SARS and MERS because those diseases were so deadly that very few people got them. Mm. If you got it, you died, or you were very, very ill very quickly. So that doesn't make sense. And in any case, geographical proximity explains very little about contagion. And this is a really key point that the network scientists have been making for years. Lazo Barabasi and Alessandro Vespignani argue that given the nature of air travel, it, there is a thing called effective distance, which is quite different from geographical distance. In practice, the United States was almost as close to China in effective distance as Taiwan, because the amount of travel from China to the United States is massive mm -hmm. up until the, the pandemic strikes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think those arguments make much sense. And indeed, we can see uh, that uh, although we still don't know everything there is to know about susceptibility to, to the virus, that there isn't some obvious explanation um, for why it didn't spread further in those East Asian countries in either the genetic or any other domain. Basically, they just took the right measures quickly and we could have done something similar, not the same, but why did... Let me just ask a question. Why did we not do anything with the technology? Why did we decide just not to bother with contact tracing? I've never heard a good answer to that question because it's not like we couldn't have graphed the network of everybody in the United States really easily. And I think the best answer that I can figure out is that the big tech companies decided there was too much downside risk to doing it. And so they punted it. And they basically decided, you know what, all of this data, which we make so much money from, which we could put to good public use, we better just not put to good public use because you never know what the consequences of doing that might be. So we, we, we just haven't really tried. And that, that seems we, to be a much better explanation. Perhaps they thought it wouldn't work in a large country that didn't have the social cohesion of Taiwan. That, you know, you know, it would work in Norway and Denmark, but when you apply that to the whole United States, perhaps not. I want to remind people that you wrote a book that we're talking about, and I want to ask you one last question about it before we let you go. Uh, you, in Doom, you referred to the twin plagues of 2020. Well, one plague we can certainly name. I'm, I'm on tenterhooks. What's the other plague? Plague of the mind. Uh, the crazy ideas, of which there were many, that, that spread through the Internet and led us into a, a state of confusion and extreme 
polarization. Everything became politicized last year, from masks to vaccines by way of remedies. And I think that's because the internet is a perfect platform for disseminating misinformation and disinformation. And it, it already was, that was the theme of the square and the tower. Uh, but it ended up being a fantastic way of confusing people about the crisis that they were facing. And, and it produced just rather in the way that the 1340s produced the, the flagellant orders, a huge wave of, of protest uh, last summer, which if one took a step back was something of a non sequitur, considering that we were in the midst of a pandemic, to have a huge nationwide wave of protests about, about police, racial discrimination and violence was odd to put it mildly. And I think it was part of that second plague that, that happened, the plague of the mind. And often those two things go hand in hand. Often you get contagions of one sort accompanied by contagions of, of the other sort. It happened in 1918, 19 as well, of course, when a very contagious idea of Bolshevism was spreading rapidly around the world. Oh, exactly. If you look in the United States at the newspapers, they're talking more about the bombing campaigns, the domestic bombing campaigns in the early 20s than they are talking about uh, whether the Spanish flu is still ravaging. Hey, we could go another 17 hours. I know we could. And we still haven't gotten to Star Trek, but that's the next time we talk ah, about happy, clappy. Utopia. If only. It's been a if great pleasure. The book is Trek. Doom. Yes, Doom. And I just get the uh, second part of it correctly here. The Politics of Catastrophe. Neil Ferguson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, gentlemen.